Well, hello and welcome everyone. I'm Kelly Weiss. I'm the Director of Marketing here at the Law School. And thanks so much to everyone who's able to join us today. We have a great speaker with us and we're gonna have some good conversation. Um, just laying out uh, some few house rules. There are not very many, but um, what we're going to do is Dean Johnson is gonna give an introduction. Mayor Steinberg will speak for a bit. And then we're going to invite you to ask some questions. And we're gonna take those through our chat function. And we will get to that later after Mayor Steinberg has had a chance uh, to speak. But um, that's about it for me. It's my pleasure to introduce Dean Johnson in our Racial Justice Speaker Series. Thanks, Kelly. And thank you all for, for being here today. We have a real pleasure in having Mayor, Mayor Daryl Steinberg of Sacramento, a, a member of the class of 1984, uh, UC Davis School of Law with us today. Now this racial justice speaker series was announced uh, at the town hall after uh, the, 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 the sad death of George Floyd. Uh, and I had hoped that over the course of the year we'd be able to discuss uh, the, the issues surrounding policing in modern America and how we might improve policing in modern America, including reducing the disparate racial impacts of our criminal justice system. Uh, last week, uh, we had the public defender from Alameda County, Brandon, Brendan Wood, uh, talk about uh, uh, his job uh, and what he's facing in, in the history of criminal justice in this country, really, and its roots in slavery. Over the course of the year, uh, we will hear from Andrew Nwachi Willig, uh, the dean at Boston University, uh, Song Richardson, the dean at UC Irvine Law School, uh, our own Irene Jo, uh, who, who's a member of the law faculty, uh, as well as Raquel Aldana, a member of the law faculty, uh, and Jack Chin, uh, also a member of the law faculty. Uh, today, we are very honored, truly, uh, to have one of Sacramento's most accomplished public servants with us, who served the, the Sacramento community for more than 20 years. He's also been a supporter of the law school for many years, was named the, the alum of the year a couple years back, and has been a frequent attendee at various King Hall Legal Foundation events over the years, including, I think, the, the, uh, the golf tournament uh, one year. Um, Mayor Steinberg uh, bought his first home in Tahoe Park in Sacramento, uh, later was elected to the city council, later ran for state assembly uh, and the California State Senate. Uh, he became the first Sacramentan in over 125 years to be elected president pro tem of the Senate. Uh, as the Senate leader, Daryl Steinberg was known for getting things done, getting things accomplishment, accomplished. Uh, as a member of the legislature, one of his um, achievements really was the Mental Health Services Act, the first of its kind in the nation that generates $2 billion a year for people in need. Now, Sacramento, like cities across the country, has serious policing issues that the community uh, is dealing with, the, the mayor is dealing with, that all of us are dealing with. Uh, and part of my thinking in putting the series together and in inviting uh, Mayor Steinberg was to get the perspective of somebody who's running a city about the various policing issues that he's facing and trying to figure out. I've always found Mayor Steinberg to be a respectful, thoughtful, and sincere um, uh, politician. Uh, and I, I've always thought of him as a leader uh, for, the, for the fight for good, frankly. Um, I do know that there are, certainly are challenges in Sacramento as in other cities. Uh, Stefan Clark case is a, is a deeply troubling one to, 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 to people, including Mayor Steinberg. Uh, I, I do want to acknowledge the, the letter uh, that some students presented yesterday, some students and some alums presented yesterday uh, about Mayor Steinberg's talk in this racial justice speaker series. I, I want to thank the students uh, for submitting the letter, for sharing their views, uh, and, and, and I appreciate their interest in these issues. And I, I hope they're watching today as, as, as Mayor Steinberg is talking, uh, because I, I'm looking forward to, to, to seeing what he has to say. Uh, so welcome virtually to UC Davis, Mayor Daryl Steinberg. 
Thank you very much, Dean Johnson. Um, Kevin, I really appreciate uh, the invitation. Uh, thank you to uh, King Hall. I, I love King Hall. Thank you to the faculty and thank you to all the students. And yes, thank you to the students who um, expressed their strong point of view about my speech. I hope we can have a good dialogue here today about um, what you believe, what I'm doing and trying to do um, as mayor of the city of Sacramento and maybe, maybe reach some common understanding. I certainly want to articulate to you, but to everyone here, where I stand on the issues of racial justice and policing and what I am trying to do about bringing the change that is so desperately needed. But maybe I'll just start with a little bit about myself. Um, I finished here at King Hall 36 years ago. It's hard to believe how fast it goes. And it is where I learned uh, to fight and where I had my first formative experience fighting for equality and justice. Tell the story many times and I won't tell the long version of it, but back in the 1980s, the law school was both progressive in admitting students with disabilities, and yet the physical layout of the law school was not accessible in all places for people in wheelchairs. And while disabled students, those in wheelchairs, practiced their moot court in a small classroom downstairs, the rest of us able-bodied people were able to practice our, our trial practice before uh, a judge and a jury in a, in, a, in a replica of a real courtroom. And I fought with uh, some of the, uh, my fellow students to change that. And the then administration resisted it harshly, claiming there was not enough money to be able to fund it. And it turned out after doing some investigation that there was in fact money, but the then uh, administration did not want to change the aesthetic look of the courtroom. And I found out that that opinion was put in writing and got that written confirmation and had it on the front pages of the Davis newspapers. And within four months, that lift was built. And it taught me and showed me the power of advocacy and translating um, what's in your heart and, and what you want to accomplish, how to translate that into tangible, real change in action. I became a un union lawyer representing fired uh, state workers uh, for 10 years. And then I got the political bug. And I am now starting my 25th year of elective service in a variety of positions, uh, city council member, state assembly member, state senator, president of the Senate, and now mayor of Sacramento, and, and proudly have a long list of hard fought progressive wins around mental health, around human trafficking, around the plight of refugees and garment workers and climate change, and every major area of, of public policy. And I've had many difficult periods during my public tenure Certainly none more difficult than drawing the short straw and becoming pro tem in 2009 as the state faced a $42 billion deficit. And most of my work during that period was centered on, you never see a bumper sticker that says it could have been worse, but trying to mitigate the impact of necessary cuts on the most vulnerable population. That was an immensely challenging time. And I want to believe that anything could be more challenging, but I will acknowledge and admit that nothing has been for me uh, as personally, personally challenging to my own identity, my own thinking of who I am and who I aspire to be as a leader, than the deaths of Stefan Clark, George Floyd, and Breonna Taylor. And once again today, we should acknowledge that while a grand jury uh, in, in Louisville uh, indicted one officer for reckless endangerment, that no officer was charged with the actual killing of Breonna Taylor, another injustice. 
And I'm mayor of Sacramento, and of course, in our city, as in every major city throughout the country, um, we have been uh, a place for uh, consistent, principled protests by people, many, many young people, who are rightfully demanding change, including 2,000 people um, who gathered around the corner from my home in June after the killing of George Floyd and staged a die-in demanding uh, that I do more. Now, when that very moving event occurred, the defensive part of me said, oh, wait a minute, look at everything that I have done. Look at the fact that I was one of only two major California mayors, major city California mayors to endorse AB 392, the Shirley Weber bill to change the use of force policies in the state of California. Look at what I have done. But I immediately realized that that was the wrong response, maybe human, but the wrong response. Because the real response and the one that I have tried and continue to try imperfectly to embrace is to dig deeper, and to ask myself, what can I be doing different or better as a leader to be a voice for the pain, for the injustice, and for the demand that we change what must be changed. I have been humbled by the events of the last number of months, and I daily ask myself, what could I have done differently? What can I be doing to use my position and my voice more effectively to bring greater change, real change, and faster change? And I will acknowledge to you that I have made my share of mistakes along the way, which I am happy to talk about. But I wanna also talk to you about where I stand, where I stand, what I have been doing, and what some of the conflicts are that I find in this role to represent my entire city. Let me begin with where I stand. I believe very strongly and have articulated consistently that systemic racism is not some myth, it is real and it is profound. Even when young African-American men don't die, their mothers and grandmothers and aunts and friends fear for their lives when they walk out the door. I know and have articulated that too many law-abiding young African-American men and women experience many of their interactions with law enforcement in hostile and negative ways. And too many African-American people die at the hands of police. I state clearly and have consistently that many African-American parents do in fact teach their 16-year-olds to hold the 10-2 position on the steering wheel when they were pulled over and to show their hands and know that as a white man who raised now adult children, I would have never thought to mention such a thing to my kids when they learned to drive. I believe and have advocated for changing the Police Officer Bill of Rights so that the public has the right to know at a very minimum what the disposition of, uh, of a case involving a, an officer involved shooting or excessive force claim, what the disposition of that has been. I strongly believe that POBAR needs to be changed so that we can root out racist cops and others who hold any views that are antithetical to having a badge and God, God forbid a gun when they hold those views. At the same time as the mayor of a city, and I don't say this at any attempt at political balancing or attempt at moral equivalence, but it's just my truth. 
that the vast majority of police officers go into the profession and go into the public service for the right reason. And they put their own lives on the line. They and their families live each day with the fear of not knowing whether they will come home alive. And yes, they confront real crime. They, can, they protect neighborhoods from gangs, robberies, home break-ins, and help people even if they're not trained to do so, having a hard time with addiction, mental illness, and simply surviving. And I have seen that. And so as mayor of this city, in the midst of Stefan Clark and George Floyd, but also what motivated me to come back to city government after 14 years in the legislature and as a legislative leader, I'm trying to lead on three fundamental pillars when it comes to race, uh, policing, and equity. And here they are, and I'd like to review them in some detail and then open it up for your questions. Number one, one of the fundamental flaws in the way we hold or do not hold police officers accountable for bad behavior is the fact that every part of an investigation based upon a claim by a citizen of this country that they have been mistreated is handled in an insular, non-transparent way. Now some state legislation in 2018 opened a window, AB 1421, and here's what I'm doing at the city. I have proposed and am pushing, even with resistance, for an independent review of every officer involved shooting any case involving force which results in serious bodily injury or any allegation of sexual assault by a police officer that an independent inspector general reporting to the city council conduct an independent investigation and publicly release their findings, their conclusions, and their recommendations for discipline no later than the same time that the city manager has the authority under our city charter to impose or not impose discipline makes his public decision whether or not discipline is warranted. Because it is essential that the, the manager um, know that there is an independent uh, individual and a commission and an office of public safety accountability that is going to check the work of the police department, its internal affairs division, and ultimately the city, city manager. And if there is a discrepancy between what the manager decides and what the inspector general decides, then it's out there for the public to be able to evaluate and to determine uh, who's right and who is wrong. I believe that is not the end by any means, but a fundamental piece of police reform. Secondly, this may be the most important change that I am leading and suggesting. I believe we must in this society and in our city redefine what we want and expect of police officers and frankly narrow the scope of their duties. It's not always their fault, by the way, but as a society, whether it's through the 911 triage system or through uh, any other ways they are called upon to respond, the police are the first and last resort for virtually every situation, except for health emergency, which is the fire department, every crisis situation that goes on in our communities. I would say up to 30 to 40% of the calls that they receive and are asked to respond to have nothing to do with an allegation of underlying criminal conduct. It's homelessness, it's mental health, it can be uh, responding to the report of an abandoned vehicle. Um, it can be any kind of a domestic situation that has not risen to the level of domestic violence. A whole variety of calls where not only are they not trained appropriately, but the very specter of 
somebody with a gun and a badge responding to a, a situation not involving criminal conduct can actually make a tense situation much worse. And so what I am proposing is that we redefine and shift funding away from the police department to establish an office of community response in the city of Sacramento. The office, we've already made a down payment of $4 million into the Office of Community Response, and it will be an office comprised of social workers, other trained outreach workers, who instead of the police, will be called upon through the 911 system and our other modalities to respond to calls that do not require a police officer. And again, to shift funding from the police department to staff and to make sure that that community-based response, not just a city response, but in collaboration with leading community-based organizations, represents a culture change and a new way of doing business. Now, if in the end, 30 to 40% of the city police department's $170 million budget is shifted to an office of community response and the numbers will never work out to an exact number. And we have a lot of work to do to get this right. But what it means is that tens of millions of dollars will in fact be shifted from policing to a non-law enforcement response. Third, my mayorship is focused on expanding what the city defines as its core responsibilities from providing basic services to the people, which will always remain a core function, but expanding that idea to say, no, a city also has a core obligation to invest its resources directly in neighborhood improvement and economic empowerment, especially in our disadvantaged neighborhoods. In 2018, I asked the voters to pass a sales tax uh, of adi an additional half cent. It was called Measure U. And I said to the voters, I want to use this additional $50 million to invest in workforce training for young people, youth services, an affordable housing trust fund, a small business loans and grants to uh, entrepreneurs who want to start or expand their businesses along our neighborhood-based commercial corridors, and other strategies that will help uplift neighborhoods, uplift communities of color, and pay attention to those who have never gotten the attention or the resources that they need or deserve. We won the election. Victory has a thousand mothers and fathers, for once we won, the traditional stakeholders of the city said, no, this is our money. And it has been a royal fight ever since. And now I'm going to the ballot again in November to require that at least $40 million of that 50 million every year be spent on what I call inclusive economic development, neighborhood-based economic development. Because no matter what we do around race and policing. If we do not have an economic strategy and define and redefine what our city's, again, core obligation must be, not just to, not just to provide the basic services, but to invest directly where investment is so desperately needed, then we will never get to the core of what is roiling our communities today. You know, I hear the term performative politics a lot, and I know that it was referenced uh, in the letter we talked about a few moments ago. And I guess I want to end a little bit with what my conflict is in terms of my own training, my own temperament, and my own experience and how I go about my work as a public official. For one of the things that um, is a source of great tension is that there are people, activists, young people, who have cried and called out for defunding the police. And I have said, 
depending upon what that means, uh, I'm not sure that I agree with it. Some have said, and some cities have said, take 30% or 40% from the police budget. And from my perspective, um, and again, based on my own training and temperament, I have a conflict with saying, take money from without being smart, thorough, and clear about how and where you want to spend that 30%. And so my way, even if it is not what I call, um, a, even if it does not garner the most, the, the most uh, satisfying political headline in the moment, is to continue to focus on what I believe is going to create real systems change. Because for me to defund and even to shift randomly without knowing how you're gonna spend the money, what you're gonna spend the money on, and what new system of community response in this instance you're going to create, it becomes a, um, again, a politically satisfying signal. But in the end, you don't necessarily get it right. And this is the conflict again, or at least what, what I think a lot about the current time that we're living in. The protests in Sacramento and throughout the country, especially the peaceful protests, are absolutely essential to push people like me and others towards change more rapidly. There is no question about it. Protest is uh, an essential tool to move any political body and any society towards addressing what the body may not be uh, not addressing intentionally, but maybe focused on other things when maybe we should be focused on what the protesters are asking us to focus on. I've been reading Parting the Waters, um, the Taylor Branch trilogy on the civil rights movement. And obviously civil disobedience and protests and the sit-ins and um, the the marches without Dr. King and Fred Shuttlesworth and James Lawson and Diane Nash and all of the others who insisted that protest and civil disobedience is the only thing that's going to get the attention of the country without that. We never would have had um, the change that we, we now celebrate and that we recognize as work still uncompleted. And yet at the same time, without translating those protests into the Civil Rights Act of 1964 or the Voting Rights Act of 1965, we not, would not have had the actual law changes that would have, uh, that would have created the protections and the culture change that has fully integrated our country. And so when it comes to defunding and when it comes to the cries out on the street for justice for George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, it is searing to me. I, I think the cry is absolutely correct and the anger is absolutely justified. And I'm trying to figure out how I, as a political leader, translate that power into tangible change in a system that has its checks and balances, has counter point of views when it comes to specific solutions, and will always, on its own, take a step back unless we take two or three steps forward together. And so I sit with the police department 
and with the police union. And by the way, as the letter, again, that uh, the students have written, um, affects me deeply, not, and I try not to be defensive about it. I want to hear it and use it to, again, do even better. At the same time, you should know that the police department, the police union, thinks I've sold them out because I talk about racial justice and because I'm pushing the shifting of tens of millions of dollars away from the police department to a new office of community response because I don't want the discipline process anymore to be an inside game and I'm insisting on an independent inspector general. And so I'm grappling with these issues in real time just as you are. And and know that, as Dr. King said, time itself is neutral. I will never say to anybody or to you, be patient, we have to wait. You shouldn't be patient. I'm not patient. I just am for myself, as mayor of a big city, trying to figure out how I can actually not do performative politics and not posture, but to actually change my city. And maybe it will be a model for other cities towards the kinds of systemic changes that will be long lasting and not revert back to the way it was if and when the attention of the country and the community shifts to other things. Thanks so much for the opportunity again to have this dialogue with you. Um, I'm happy to talk about any of my history, to talk about any of these issues, to talk about um, what's going on in Sacramento and throughout the country um, and, to, and to listen and to respond. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Mayor Steinberg. Now, now we have a, a good amount of time for, for questions and response. And if you send on chat to Kelly Weiss, um, she can uh, ask your question for you. So if you have any questions, please send them to Kelly Weiss on chat. Okay, everybody, give me one second while I'm sort of queuing up here and we'll try to get to, to everyone's questions. Um, we have a question from Laura. Uh, Mayor Steinberg, she says, "Why did you, what did you do to bring justice for Stefan Clark? Well, first of all, um, I spoke out clearly and said that the killing of Stefan Clark was wrong. I gave my state of the city address uh, in the year after he was killed. Um, in Meadowview in South Sacramento, one of our low-income neighborhoods, and talked about racial injustice and policing, and proposed that $40 million a year out of the city budget be spent on neighborhood and economic empowerment in disadvantaged neighborhoods. I pushed the city police to change its use of force policy to, um, eliminate, or at least to eliminate in most instances, the ability of an officer to pursue any suspect on foot because those chases too often end up in tragedy. But I want to acknowledge and admit to you that the two initiatives which I have described that I am championing, both the independent inspector general and the Office of Community Response and the shifts of what I hope will be tens of millions of dollars from police to a non-law enforcement response to various crises, that I wish that I had championed those after Stefan Clark's killing instead of waiting until after George Floyd's killing. That's one of the areas where I ask myself, what could I have done differently? Now, I know what my reason was, what my reasoning was, but I wish I had done it different. The reasoning was this. 
I was focused on Measure U and the economic empowerment agenda. That was really my focus. I felt that if I could um, push the police department to change, but focus my capital and my energy on creating a sustained, inclusive economic development strategy for our city, that I would have more success. And I wish that I had taken the mantle on shifting money from the police and the independent inspector general earlier. Uh, it's never too late, it's never too early. But um, I did a lot after Stefan Clark shooting. I was very outspoken about it. I supported 392, Shirley Weber's bill. And again, it was only two mayors of major uh, California cities, Libby Schaaf being the other who supported the bill. But I wish that I had uh, done more in terms of local initiative around uh, redefining and narrowing, frankly, uh, the role of a police officer in our city. Uh, Mayor Steinberg, we have a question from Amal who writes, please share your thoughts about mental health officers, not social workers being deployed rather than police officers. I'm not sure I understand the question. Are we talking about mental health workers who are not social workers or police officers with mental health backgrounds? My reading of the question, because um, I can see it in front of me, it looks like um, asking if mental health officers should be sent instead of police officers. Yes, in many situations. That's exactly what it is that um, I am proposing. And again, the city has put a $4 million down payment in establishing a new department, a department that is staffed with people with mental health experience who can respond to somebody uh, in crisis, in a, either in a family situation at home or a homeless person out on the street. We're actually putting our homeless services division within our office of community response because there's such a connection between uh, the homeless problem, mental health, and the outreach that we currently tell police officers to engage in without the training. And instead, we're gonna shift that. Mental health is, you know, the cause of my lifetime. I, I'm the author of California's Millionaire's Tax. Uh, Prop 63, the Mental Health Services Act, as Dean Johnson said, generates $2.4 billion a year. It has helped save the mental health system in California, but we still have a broken system. It's still fragmented. It still uh, does not serve people uh, before they fall through the cracks and get really sick. We've got a stage four system of mental health care where just like with cancer, if you get help, you only get help generally if you've landed in jail or, 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 or in, a, in an emergency room. And we're fighting every day at the state level to try to create a stage one or two system where people get the preventative mental health care that they need before they suffer terrible life consequences that are hard to recover from. And so, yes, mental health and mental health outreach workers are an essential part of shifting resources from the police department to a new office of community response in Sacramento. Uh, we have a, a question from uh, Stefan Clark's grandmother, I believe, who is on the call, uh, Sequette Clark, who says, how soon will the independent inspector general be put into place? <clears throat> we just had a meeting on it today. I believe the position will be advertised within the next week or two. And uh, once that person is hired, uh, however long that takes, 30, 60 days, uh, the office will be up and running. And um, in the case of uh, Stefan, and, uh, and I'm really glad that you joined the call today. Is it, is it Skrita who's on the, who's on the call? Um, yes, I'm sorry yeah. if I missed No, that's okay. Um, you have been um, a brave grandmother and an outspoken uh, champion for change, and I'm honored to know you and your family. 
Um, in, in Stefan's case, what would have been different here, it would have been different that we would have had, we would have had an independent investigation. Now the Attorney General did an independent investigation, but that's still law enforcement. We would have had an independent investigation in the city reporting to the public at the same time that the police and internal affairs investigation went forward. And that inspector general would have said what they believed was the appropriate disposition and outcome of the case. Now, whether people would have, whatever they would have concluded and whether people would have agreed or disagreed, at least there would have been a check on a process which is now an insular process. And it would have been much better and it'll be much better going forward. So hopefully within a couple of weeks, that person, well, within a couple of weeks, the position will be posted. Soon after that, 30, 45 days, I hope that position will be filled. Nothing, by the way, in government happens nearly fast enough. It's one of my great frustrations that, especially under the system that we have in Sacramento, that it takes forever to actually move an initiative forward. And I'd say I spend a lot of my day uh, pushing, prodding, insisting that we um, get done what we told people we, were, we, we will get done. And, and this issue of, uh, of launching the inspector general position is, is, is one of those issues. Okay, thank you. Uh, a question came in from Colin who says, uh, how do you think we can carry forward the fight for economic justice and labor rights that Dr. King pivoted to before his murder? What role does labor exploitation play in racial injustice and vice versa? So as I told you, I'm a former labor lawyer um, and a and a lifelong believer that the collective power of a union is the best hope that we have in our country to raise the standard of living for people who are making uh, much less than they deserve to make and that is required to live in an ever expensive United States and especially in California. And so empowering the labor movement is essential. State the obvious. Um, electing a president of the United States who supports organized labor, uh, having a United States Senate that will not push back uh, the rights of working people, but in fact move them forward. These are crucial and you know, we could talk about the Supreme Court and we know what is probably going to happen with Justice Ginsburg's seat, which is gonna make it all the more difficult to overturn the decision which has crippled many labor unions by making it illegal, absent affirmative consent for unions to collect fair share fees. And so supporting organized labor, supporting collective bargaining, um, believe and knowing that that is the key to enlarging middle class is, is everything. But there's other tools as well. And I want to go back to this idea of this sort of radical, seemingly radical in my city anyways, idea that I have had that the city ought to be a direct investor in economic empowerment in our neighborhoods. And I want to re restate because it's an important point that cities have traditionally defined their role as collecting the taxpayer money and then providing basic services to people, uh, whether it's public safety services, which are the lion's share of the budget. If there's a little money left over, we invest in the libraries and in maintaining the parks and some very modest youth programs. And of course, on the utility side, we pick up the garbage and we provide the basic utilities to people. That's the way the city culture defines its role. And what my predecessor in this job and I have changed, or at least tried to change, is to suggest that in 2020, 
in major American cities that a city's responsibility, including its budget, must be much more than that. We have to have room to invest in community-based organizations. We must have an affordable housing strategy, including a finance plan to work with nonprofit developers to build more affordable housing, including a real career pathway program across all industries so that as we grow clean, green jobs here, that the young people from our neighborhoods, especially our disadvantaged neighborhoods, are educated, trained, and first in line for those jobs. And that that takes money. And that you just can't rely on the private sector, the nonprofit community, but government itself needs to be a catalyst towards empowering our neighborhoods. And that's, that gets squeezed out every time when it comes to what the city uh, sees its role as and what it chooses to fund. And I'm trying to change that and resist that. Huge resistance uh, because, well, huge resistance because it's a, it's a change. Um, and so economic empowerment needs every tool at its disposal. Strong unions, but also a direct investment strategy uh, from and within the city itself. I'd like to correct the record, my mistake that I identified um, uh, Sequet Clark as um, Stefan Clark's grandmother, and in fact, it was it is his mother. So my sincere apologies. Oh, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry, Mayor Steinberg. That was my mistake. Um, yeah. So sorry. Uh, so uh, we have another question here from uh, Gracia, who says, "Why is your police force facing protesters with riot gear and tear gas?" How is this an appropriate response against folks demanding racial justice? So there was the, there was the aftermath of the George Floyd protests. And then there were the protests about three, maybe four weeks ago now um, that um, where hundreds of people attended. And here's, <laughs> here's what happened a couple of weeks ago. The police department and the police chief um, clearly stated that if protesters um, break windows or spray graffiti, that they would be held accountable, but that the police would not intervene in any kind of fiscal way to protect the public and to protect the officers themselves. That if any individual actually broke into a place of business, that they would go in and arrest them. And in fact, the, there was no tear gas or was no, uh, there, there, there were no confrontations. What was the end result of that in terms of the community response? The Sacramento County Sheriff and many members of the business community complained vociferously that the police department was not nearly um, as forceful as they should have been to prevent the window breaking and the other relatively minor damage to property. But the police chief and I um, held our ground and said that our policy going forward is going to be just as I described it, to do everything possible to de-escalate even when people are engaging in uh, illegal conduct. Let me go back to the George Floyd protests. I got it from both sides. There are, there were people, lots of people, the business community who said that the curfew that we eventually established after millions of dollars worth of property damage and, and, uh, and businesses that still have not reopened as a result of it, that we called for a curfew a day late. And then, of course, there were those in the community who said we never should have caused a curfew. And I guess this is the way I view it. I do not agree with the use of rubber bullets or tear gas. It, it, certainly, um, only, only, only as an absolute last, last resort and as an alternative to even more um, serious and potentially lethal force. But we do have to draw a line here. Um, and the line is this, the police ought to get out of the way when it comes to peaceful principled protest. 
And when the police arrested nine protesters after the Stefan Clark, uh, the DA's decision to not prosecute Stefan Clark came out, I was publicly critical of the police department for doing that because there was no violence, there was no, there, there was no uh, reason to arrest people in the first place. But in June, this last June after George Floyd's killing, there has to be a line. There has to be a line between peaceful protests and where the police uh, do anything that impedes or impinges upon that, they need to be called out for that. There's also no damn excuse for people to, to loot and to riot and to destroy small businesses, hardworking people, by the way, many of them people of color, many of them immigrants who are just working hard to, to, to run a business. And we had $10 million worth of damage in our city. That's unacceptable too. That's not what Dr. King taught. Just the opposite of what Dr. King taught. And I just think we're going to call each other on our own stuff. As you're calling me on mine, and I'm acknowledging to you, they did a few moments ago that my in initiative, which I think are powerful initiatives, I should have introduced those after Stefan Clark's killing, not after George Floyd. I think everybody needs to own the fact that it's unacceptable to be destroying anybody else's property and people need to be held accountable for that. I, I have a question that kind of pivots to, a, to another topic and this is from Professor Jasmine Harris. And she says, how are you thinking about the intersections of race and disability? When we are talking about structural racism, I encourage you to think about de-institutionalization, de <laughs> excuse me, broadly, it's a mouthful, prisons, jails, psychiatric hospitals, large-scale institutions, uh, not as big of a problem in California anymore, but still around. Uh, what are your thoughts on this? So let me tell you about a chapter in my life, uh, because it tells you how I think about this. In 2013, Governor Brown, who was an ally and has actually led quite a bit on, uh, on progressive reform, progressive criminal justice reform, he was faced and the state was faced with the federal courts telling us, as they had told us for 10 years, that our prisons were overcrowded. And Governor Brown suggested and made a formal policy recommendation that we deal in part with our overcrowding by building more jail cells at the local level. And I looked at that and saw that it was backed by the Speaker of the Assembly, the Republican leaders, the law enforcement community. They had a big press conference. And it was maybe the most important press conference of my life that I never, that I chose not to participate in. Because I said, Governor, we're not going to build our way out of this. We need real resources for recidivism reduction, for rehabilitation, for um, aftercare for those with mental health issues who, who leave the state prisons. And we had a big fight and ended up compromising where we got almost $100 million for, uh, for the programmatic part of this. Um, I believe that you uh, were never gonna build our way out of this. I was a strong supporter of Prop 47 and all of the criminal justice reform uh, ballot measures that have come for the, the people of California. Um, because 70% recidivism rate for people who leave prison without any kind of uh, program to help them gain vocational skills to deal with their mental health and substance abuse issues. You don't have to be a genius to know that if we do not deal, hold people accountable, but deal with root causes, that all we're doing is creating uh, a revolving door. Now, I think our public policy in this area has moved very rapidly towards a progressive, uh, a progressive policy orientation. Um, with, with the changes that have been made over the course of time to our probation and parole laws, again, Prop 47. And it's another 
great fissure between the law enforcement communities and, um, and I think the majority of Californians. Um, criminal justice reform maybe is just beginning, but it, um, in California, I think we've shown a better way than just building more jail cells and more prisons. I think we're sort of reaching the end here, but um, I'll end with a, a broad question from another one of our faculty members, Professor Raquel Donna. And she says, what reforms do you think are the most viable, both politically and in terms of funding and effectiveness to shift policing culture? I, I think obviously you cannot provide and or require as much training and bias training, mental health training uh, for police officers. There needs to be a fundamental um, shift in terms of requiring anybody who puts on a badge to have been fully vetted in terms of holding any views that can be seen as discriminatory towards people of color. All that is important but I don't think nearly as fundamental as narrowing the definition and thus the role of what we expect police officers to be and to do. Because so long as we ask them to do everything, they are going to find themselves in more situations where confrontation um, and sometimes bad decisions and bad behavior and, and unacceptable outcomes are going to occur. Police should be available to respond to uh, real crime. That's what you want police officers to do. You don't need them, nor do we want them to be in every situation involving somebody who's dealing with a mental health crisis. Certainly with domestic violence, which is a crime, you may want the police officer out there the first time accompanied by a social worker, but unless you have a, a warm handoff so that the victim certainly can get the help that she needs, the police officer is going to end up coming back a dozen times. And so redefining and narrowing what we expect the police to do, and then shifting the resources in a real way, in a systemic way, to a non-law enforcement response. Mm -hmm. I think is um, the most fundamental change we can make to policing. That and making sure that any time there is an allegation of misconduct, that the public knows there's going to be a full and independent review. And I know I said in answer to Ms. Clark that we hope to have that inspector general within a couple of months. I hope it's a couple of months. Uh, it probably will be uh, a, a little bit longer. But um, those to me are the, the, the two key pieces, accountability and transparency, but also let's narrow what we expect people with that much power uh, to, to do. Thank you, Mayor. And we had such, so many comments here and questions and we weren't able to get to all of them, but um, thank you. And, Dean Johnson. Yeah, thanks and thanks, thanks, Mayor Steimer. That was wonderful. Um, we continue to be proud of you at UC Davis School of Law, and thanks for spending the time with us because uh, I know your time is very precious. I also want to thank the the audience for the great questions and the great feedback. Uh, I appreciate it, and please stay tuned. We'll be having uh, in just a few more weeks uh, another. Um, segment in this uh, racial justice speaker series and we'll have speakers throughout the spring. So take care and thanks very much.